Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the CII Accredited Risk Authority webinar on cladding systems and insurance information requirements. Uh, now, this webinar was originally designed to introduce the new IQ7 questionnaire, uh, but in view of the recent information coming out of the Grenfell Inquiry, I've extended it a little bit just to include consideration uh, of some of these new challenges. <clears throat> now, we have around 700 subscribers for this web uh, webinar, uh, which is open exclusively to the Risk Authority membership. Uh, and I think this actually uh, breaks all the records to date. Um, we'll try and do it justice. Um, I'm sure many of you are pretty expert in this field anyway, uh, but I hope with the uh, additions, um, we can make it, uh, certainly make it uh, still be worthwhile your attendance. Uh, Courtney is on hand from her sick bed to handle uh, any technical queries you have with sound or video. Um, so please use the chat to communicate that. Uh, and also use the chat to submit any questions you may have uh, we won't be able to answer these on the fly, um, but uh, hopefully those of you will uh, attended these before. Uh, we do send a follow-up email um, <clears throat> where we seek pretty comprehensive answers to all your questions. Right, so without further ado, um, we will get started. Uh, part of the CI requirement is to describe who I am. Uh, I'm Jim Glockling and um, uh, run the uh, Risk Authority Scheme and currently convene the sort of passive working group under which uh, this um, work is uh, uh, organized through. The contents and learning objectives uh, for this, um, what I plan to go through is really the challenges of standards. Um, a new additional consideration, really referring to the output from the Grenfell Inquiry. Uh, look at the methods of planning system approval, uh, which are pretty complex, uh, looking at the applicable standards. Uh, many of you may have heard of Class O and, uh, and the problems associated with it, and I'll just try and uh, touch on that point as to now that, why that is now a discredited way uh, of confirming material suitability uh, in these sorts of applications. Um, Cross-reference some of the shortcomings of BS8414. Uh, this uh, probably hops back to um, work which we did with ABI, where we did some full-scale studies um, post-Grenfell uh, of the, it is, uh, the, whether 8414 is fit for purpose for understanding everything that there is about cladding systems. Um, and then really to introduce the IQ cladding system information requirement. This is IQ7, um, which is a suite of questionnaires which we have to help you elicit the information that you need uh, to understand the risks associate, associated uh, with the systems you might be presented with. So this should take approximately 60 minutes and I'll endeavor to do my best to stick to time. Starting with standards, um, it's not easy putting standards in place um, uh, and uh, very, very difficult to produce things which are always meaningful and infallible. Um, but when we look at what we're trying to do at smaller scale, we're trying to uh, de describe the performance of a whole building uh, in the laboratory. Now, this can happen at a number of scales. On the left hand side, um, we see really uh, material component tests. Uh, which are lab scale experiments, which gives you the fundamentals of the individual materials that might go, might go into making up uh, any given system. Now, the beauty of this sort of testing, it's very cheap and easy. It's a small scale test. Construction detailing is irrelevant, and we know that many of our challenges come about, come around due to imperfection in construction detailing. But when you look at things at the, at the material level, um, these can become irrelevant. Um, so there's no implied other forms of protection. It's looking at the fundamental properties uh, of the individual materials themselves uh, to withstand fire. Um, and of course, taking this approach, it addresses all the issues to do with modification, wear and tear, and imperfection in installation and maintenance throughout life. So these are absolutely dependable tests. As we go up in the scale, we see devices like this. This is the cut burner test, which takes a small a uh, 10 centimeter square piece of uh, whatever the product is. And it can be a built up product in its own right, a composite of materials. If you think in terms of sandwich panels, you could take a sandwich, a piece of sandwich panel, and it could just be looking at the metal face of the sandwich panel. And you do have to question whether tests like this can exert enough influence uh, to show realistic performance of how it might impact, say, the polystyrene core below. Now, these are slightly more expensive tests to do. Component tests, and they may permit uh, um, 
they, they may shield the material becoming fully involved in the way that it might do in practice. And some of you will remember the problems we had with sandwich panels um, in the early 80s. And really, it was probably a, a, um, a lot of it was due to testing at this sort of scale that maybe gave a false view of safety um, of these materials when really they needed to be tested at a much greater scale. As we go up in size, we get a lot. We get to the scale of rigs, and this is the BS8414 rig, which you'll heard a lot about uh, in, in in recent years um, post Grenfell, where we get onto more realistic scales. But even so, they're not perfect. They're very expensive tests. They are system tests, and so they can permit um, demonstration of the function of combustible materials if they are appropriately constructed to be. Um, protected behind more or, 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 or better performing materials um, and, and encapsulated in that way. So really to be relevant, it requires total accuracy. And obviously we know from experience now um, that this isn't testing all the features that you might see um, on the outside of a building. So you'll notice there are no windows, there are no ducts, there are no vents. Um, but also <coughs> you can construct with greater or lesser de levels of accuracy. Um, so it tests to design perfection. Um, of course, at the um, end game, we could burn down the whole building, uh, but that's not really practical uh, uh, to, to do. Um, and actually, that wouldn't also address some of the aging issues that we have. So um, really, the, the whole situation is complex. And what the test gives you to varying degrees is some are relevant to more uh, to different levels of scale than others. Some are more dependable than others, and some of them can be monkeyed with um, uh, to a greater or lesser degree. And this is one of the problems which is becoming more and more evident as we hear more evidence from the uh, Grenfell inquiry. Um, and one of the problems they have, the challenges we have, is that um, certainly around Grenfell, the test became more of a focus of effort rather than the real life situation. Everyone became fixed on the 8414 test and playing with it to achieve a pass rather than focusing on what those materials had to do on a building and how they might perform. The whole concept, concept of uh, standardization actually limits the variation uh, with which materials get tested. So it can actually become quite a bad thing at the end of the day. And we know from testing we've done in other fields, particularly with suppression systems, um, some are better than others. Uh, but actually, um, to have a suite of tests shows that it's been uh, systems and products have been tested in lots of different ways, and you can get greater comfort from this variety rather than single point look. Um, we obviously there's a criticism of many any standard that can simply be repeated until a pass is achieved, and all failures forgot and all failures forgotten. It's going to be a poor test. Fires can be chaotic, and you may get lucky on one occasion. And certainly this is a, um, a, a criticism of uh, much of the Grenfell testing, where an awful lot of testing was done until a pass was achieved. And uh, no one thought to look back at uh, the meaning that can be gained from those failed tests. Finally, the, the other criticism is fires happen because the world is imperfect, yet often as not, the samples um, delivered for testing um, uh, are, are, take, uh, are put together with enormous care, uh, often as not much greater care than they would actually be put up on a building in practice. Uh, so we can see there's no concept of looking for susceptibility or deviation from perfection. So I don't mean to be critical of all standards. Some are better than others, and it's understandable that um, different groups of people and in different areas of the industry, the fire industry, can attach a different level of relevance to them. But at the end of the day, some things are easy and some things are difficult. You'll notice as we look back at some of these tests, um, the ones on the left-hand side are component tests, whereas as soon as you get to these built-up abilities to test composites of materials, they become system tests. At the end of the day, the difference is if I have non combustible materials, like that stack of bricks there, it doesn't matter how I stack them. I can stack them uh, carefully. I can stack them uh, just randomly, but they're still not going to burn. But when I have a suite of materials that go into effectively making a composite, it becomes absolutely critical how those components are, uh, are arranged. And in that become the, the challenges of uh, installation perfection and through life wear and tear to whether the 
um, through over the life of the material or whether it even had it in the first place, had that resilience to fire uh, from the uh, construction itself. Obviously, going for non-combustible materials uh, leads you down a nice path in some respects in that we end up with lots of very safe buildings, uh, but it does curtail the sort of designs that we can actually do in the long run and, and simply isn't practical. Uh, but going non the non-combustible route, certain elements are as fire safe as the day they were built, and generally they tend to stay that way. But they don't produce the prettiest buildings, and they probably don't even allow construction of the type of buildings that we need to make our towns and cities um, the places which we, we want to live in. So it does need to be a compromise at the end of the day. The new consideration now that has come out, I don't know if any of you have been listening to the Grenfell Inquiry. It is live streamed through YouTube uh, and is making for compulsive listening at the moment. Um, but what we are hearing from the man manufacturers of some products, uh, they're addressing currently the insulation products from Celotex and Kingspan, is actually the corruption and deception that went in to demonstrating these material, materials as being fit for purpose uh, and meeting the certification requirements for use over 18 meters in height. Now this throws in um, some really uh, difficult things for us to address and for you to address. Um, because basically what's written on the tin uh, may not be what you think it is. And I think when listening through on the uh, certainly the Kingspan, Kingspan inquiry, uh, I picked up probably that it could be six different formulations. So they refer to a formulation called old technology, which it appears was able to satisfy some of the fire tests. And then in, at a certain date, I think around 2006, they may have um, transferred to what they call new technology, which seems to not be able to pass tests. But even then, um, they make reference to blends A, B, and C, and they make reference to other blends which may have had solar additives uh, in them as well. So we're at a loss to know what is on buildings currently, and we will need to understand that in the fullness of time and work out a way of doing it. Uh, but I'll give you more on that later. But it introduces, uh, as soon as it introduces uh, levels of mistrust due to the materials themselves and actually uh, the methods um, that we use to achieve a pass and whether it was even for the right material, life gets very difficult indeed. Now certification uh, within the UK uh, is complex uh, because obviously we have different factors relevant to England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Um, the dependencies, the key, key issues are what country, they have different rules, what height the building is uh, and what the building is used for. And within this, um, there are different definitions for, if for the English uh, um, uh, building regulations. We have the concept of relevant buildings. I'll go into that. We also have materials with, which are exempted uh, from uh, when the combustibility ban is uh, enforced. And wall construction and surface detailing. Now, I've put this in because it is very difficult as you read through the building regulations to know what a wall is. And that may sound stupid, but uh, try it yourself and try and determine um, what a wall is. I'll go into that in more detail uh, in due course. And obviously, the other key factor is how close to the boundary a building is, because that can infect, uh, affect uh, fire spread to other buildings. Now, I'll just touch on the, the key routes to certification that we have in the UK are the actual fire properties of the materials themselves, the elemental tests of each of the components, and this comes under the heading of the EN fire classification methods, uh, uh, where it's all summarized in BS EN 13501. And I'll go through that, each of those, in, in more detail soon. But there is another route that is offered for certain building types, and that is BS 8414, the cladding, the uh, large scale cladding rig tests, and uh, an approve a certification process through BR 135. And there's also a CISA standard to that, BS 9414, and this was newly created um, to enable interpolation of data uh, between 8414 test findings. And I'll go into that in more detail. So already it's getting a little bit complicated. Now, there are differences between countries. I put it, the differences very crudely put here, and um, but I'll go into more detail 
later. We are actually putting together a, a toolkit, possibly as a website, which I'll demonstrate a functioning version of it later, uh, just to show the complexities that we have. But the key points in England, the threshold for change of consideration materials is 18 meters. That doesn't hold for all buildings over 18 meters. It must apply to relevant buildings. And for these ones, this is where the so-called combustible band comes in. <clears throat> and the certification routes of the Euro class and BR135 or BS8414 testing for some buildings. And it applies to all wall components. I say that, but it's not necessarily the structural wall components. It's from that point forward, which might involve the linings, the insulation, uh, and the uh, any cladding on the outside of that. When you go to Scotland, they have a threshold of 11 meters. They don't have a concept of differentiation between buildings, relevant buildings. Um, so it applies to all buildings. Um, but uh, it also applies to shorter buildings over a certain area. And they use your Euro class and the 8414 and BR135 ratings for all. But there are differences in how the wall is treated um, in that sometimes there is differentiation between the external wall cladding, that is the exterior surface, and the insulation behind it might be treated separately. And the Welsh rules are pretty similar to the English rules, except they don't have a concept of relevant buildings, so they're similar. But I think they do also allow some uh, antiquated um, a viewpoint on class naught materials, which have been removed from, I believe, all, all other standards. But this is a little bit work in progress. So it's quite complex. Talking about a wall, I apologize for this slide, but I've put this in just to show you the sort of differences uh, for England. Uh, you or I might generally think of a wall as being predominantly the structural bit uh, and anything else that's on it. That's not necessarily the case with our building regulations. A lot of the testing starts forward of the structural element. Um, so in the case of the rain screen cladding system there, there might be uh, a, a sheathing board, um, there might be insulation, an air gap, and the ACM on top. And most of the testing is really forward of the um, external wall of the compartment, um, which is, okay, fine if you think of it as a, a, a masonry building or steel frame building with, with infill. Um, it gets a little bit more complex uh, when you think of those elements being um, combustible too, such as cross-laminated timber. And uh, I'm in communication with D uh, MHCLG um, about where that comes into play and whether it's part of the combustible ban. It's not actually clear to me yet, which may sound surprising, uh, but I think there's more homework to do on that. We have other types of wall too. Obviously, um, 8414 is also pertinent to ethics type systems, so external thermal insulated um, systems on the outside of buildings. Uh, with a render finish over the top. But just to show you the sorts of differences for England, well, a relevant building, um, we'll come on to what that actually means. Uh, it, the uh, regulation deals with all wall components and it sets a specification uh, for their Euro class. No route through for BS8414 there. Um, it is very strict in what it asks for. But when you get to a non-relevant buildings over 18 meters in height, it's consideration of the surface rather than the wall and there's a specification for the insulation separately. Um, and uh, when you are at different distance of the boundaries, uh, these change, uh, these, these, these um, factors change again. And actually, as you go up in height, um, the requirements can also change where they start to look for higher performing materials, the higher you up, go up the building. Um, but there are, there's an alternative specification route than the Euro class. You've got BS8414 which is an all wall test. And then when you go to non-relevant buildings, less than 18 meters in height, it's really to do with the surface itself and uh, nothing to do with the internals of the wall um, and uh, an alternative method of using uh, uh, 8414 as a whole wall test. I almost regret putting that slide in now because I probably confused you to the point, but I think uh, hopefully we can add clarity to this now. So look at height and uh, usage and height compliance options. And we, in our English building regulations, um, we see relevant buildings. Um, and you can see there that that's to the combustible ban. Basically, all materials must be, must be A2 or A1. We'll come into the meanings, full meanings of those later. 
And for all other buildings, you have two route, two, two options, basically. Route A is the um, fire performance and materials option, <coughs> which is given in paragraphs 10.5 to 10.8, or you can do a BS8414 test. Um, now, usage and height, what actually is a relevant building? Um, so a relevant building, first off, is something over 18 meters. It contains one or more dwellings, or contains an institution, contains a room for residential purposes. But that said, it excludes any room in a hostel, a hotel, or a boarding house. Now, I have written to MHCLG to query as to why hotels have been excluded, because they seem to exhibit, in my view, uh, all the same risk profiles, if not uh, some more ones, uh, more uh, over and above uh, than, than dwellings have, in that they are sleeping risks, uh, densely populated buildings, and uh, you know, in the case of hotels, there can be a lack of familiarity with the property as well. And so you would think that these were good con good credentials for including them within the combustible ban, but the answer that I received is they have not been included because hotels would be subject to whole building simultaneous evacuation whereas dwellings and residential properties might have stay put policies or phased evacuation. Um, but I'll leave you to make your own mind up uh, about that. So as we, uh, there's further clarification on uh, what some of these mean by institutions, uh, but it includes student accommodation, care homes, sheltered housing, hospitals, and dormitories in boarding schools. Uh, so these seem fairly, Clear cut and well defined, um, but they don't actually fit in with the government's own classification of purpose groups. So, um, uh, in, within ADB, um, the different uh, types of occupancy are classified as purpose groups, and I think most of them fit into this, but when you get to 2B, you can see that hotel, boarding houses, residential colleges, we can see uh, it, some of those are included and some of them are not. So it would be incorrect to use the purpose groups as the definition of uh, what, uh, as a discerning factor between the differing requirements for cladding systems. I mentioned earlier that some materials are exempt for consideration uh, from this, and these relate to generally the smaller items um, which do not have a universal presence throughout the cladding system. So things like cavity trays, door frames and windows, uh, basically I think they're there because they should be fire stopped on their other side, electrical installations. The one that is does seem surprising is membranes because these are universally throughout the system. But we have, and we have shown in our own laboratory that uh, many of the membranes can spread fire faster than the cavity barriers, the uh, intermessing cavity barriers can react. But there is later clarification on this, and they do set a requirement, uh, as stated in 1015 there, for a minimum of class B S3. So those are the exempt materials. Now let's talk about all other buildings. Now these are identified um, in sections 10.5 to 10.8, or you can conduct BS 8414 testing. So when we look at the, this describes uh, their requirements in terms of the external surface of the building and not necessarily what is deeper in there. And um, so you'll see in table 10.1, there are a range of Euroclass requirements and there are two columns really, well, uh, there, are, there are changes in height obviously, but there are two columns which depend on how close to a boundary you are or not. And when you are um, close to a boundary's edge, it's pretty simple and very clearly defined. When you are further from a boundary edge, you can see that there can be a weakening or strengthening of the surface fire spread uh, or surface combustibility uh, requirements uh, at different heights of the building. So it's not uncomplex. So uh, let's have a look at uh, buildings which aren't relevant. And these are the things which rather surprised me as I went through them. Office buildings of any height, hotels of any height, residential dwellings below 18 meters, any build, building below 18 meters, 
And there are some legacy things as well during the transition page, certain retrofits of existing relevant buildings and relevant buildings subject to a trans the transitional arrangement. This is as the, the, these are buildings which were probably under construction at the time when the regulation uh, had changed. So I think the thing to take away from this is that um, whilst we uh, are obviously fully supportive uh, of the combustible ban, um, in terms of insurance, it really doesn't go far enough to protecting property, asset and business, because many of these are big, expensive buildings. They will be buildings of the tallest type, and yet they don't come under the combustible ban. I wanted to move on to the, we mentioned the Euro class standards. So in 13501, it basically is a means of assessing the, the Euro class based on a suite of five other tests for materials. And these are very well defined. So we have in 5.2, it mentions the non-combustibility test, EN ISO 1182. 5.3, a heat of combustion test, EN ISO 1716. 5.4, single burning item test, EN 13823. And then we have finally the ignitability test, uh, EN ISO 11925-2. And what EN 13501 does is really take, takes the outputs from all these tests to arrive at a classification. And there's some additional things it does in there also in providing information on smoke production and propensity to produce burning droplets. So let's have a look at each of these. I prefer to do it pictorially so you can actually see uh, what's being done here. Um, the 1182 is a non-combustibility test. So this is not a built-up test. This is where you take <coughs> excuse me, the individual elements and basically put it in a furnace and you weigh what gets lost from it uh, at the end of the day. So these are the type of tests we quite like. They're pretty difficult to fool. And these tests are relevant to the uh, assignation of classes uh, A1 and A2. If you're wondering what the subscripts are, you'll see FL and L. FL re uh, refers to flooring products and L refers refers to uh, linear pipe thermal insulating products. Um, so a very simple non-combustibility test. Really a refinement of that test is what is commonly known as really the bomb calorimeter. So this is a heat of combustion test where a small sample of material, again, individual element of each material, nothing to do with built up systems yet, um, is put into a bomb calorimeter. And in this situation, we are, uh, it determines the heat of combustion of that material in an environment which is uh, of raised oxygen and basi basically anything that can burn will burn. It is an absolute test of combustibility. So again, a nice small scale bench test which tells you an awful lot about the material. Um, 5.4 is what's commonly known as a single burning item test. Now this is the first test that we're seeing where you can look at uh, the performance of built up systems. So it's really a calorimeter, quite a large scale one of a sort of small room scale. And you can see that a built up sample can be put on wheels and wheeled into position there. And then a fire source, a gas fire source is, is, is put in it or against it. And its reaction to fire is assessed. <coughs> now this is commonly used for uh, testing things like sandwiched panel type products. And actually, I think in probably that uh, middle photograph there, you can see that looks like a built up wall arrangement, which looks to be steel faced and may well have, uh, you know, a foam type insulation behind it. But this test is looking at for that fire source, um, whether uh, it, it allows the front face of whatever is on the composite to protect the materials behind. Um, the challenge with tests of this type is really whether you whether the, uh, the the fire source that is impacting upon it is enough and realistic enough to 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 get the uh, composite to start to play in a meaningful fashion. Uh, so these are these tests are they need to be assessed for relevance to you. Now that that fire there may be fine for if you're the only fire source you can have is a waste paper basket. But if it was anything like a petrol or a diesel spill, it might not be appropriate and you might not learn enough from the test. But it's still a very good and repeatable test. 
They get on to a very traditional ignitability test. So this is a, a flame test where a sample uh, is put onto a vertical substrate in well-controlled well conditions and flame sizes of different sizes applied to it. Obviously, you'll see along the bottom there, it's not relevant to A1 or A2 classifications uh, because uh, inherently they should not ignite. But it looks at the flame spread uh, of that material. And then the final test, which I've really included for completeness, is uh, looks like a, a, a chip fryer um, that is actually uh, a radius panel um, that will um, impact upon floor coverings and um, assess its capability uh, to, to, to withstand that as an incident fire source. So those are the key tests. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, on that journey to achieve a Euroclass rating, they also look at smoke production, and that is assessed, I think, from the uh, single burning item test, where S1 says it contributes little or no smoke, and S2 um, either says it exceeds S1 or it's not, not declared or not measured. So it's slightly unhelpful in that respect, but the assumption should always be made um, if these figures are not accompanied or if you have CNS2 um, assume that it is a smoke producer. And the other very important uh, element to know from these is the uh, flaming droplets formation. Uh, flaming droplets are particularly problematic. We're used to fires spreading upwards, and generally that is the mechanism which is quite fundamental to how we fight fires. Um, but obviously flaming droplets can allow fires to burn downwards as well, which in the case of things like Lackanall House um, <coughs> can present very terrible challenges uh, for, for people to address. Um, so a zero means no flaming droplets are produced uh, within the uh, EN 13823 test within 10 minutes. Um, S1 uh, say that, that some are produced, um, but they don't exist for very long. Uh, and two is a, a sort of failure where it ignites paper um, sat in the base of the test chamber itself. So those are the, the meanings of those. Now, probably worth touching on class naught. Hopefully you have a good enough understanding of the uh, uh, Euro class um, tests now and the logic behind them. And they are a pretty robust uh, suite of tests. Um, class naught, where did it come from? Well, actually class naught doesn't even come from a test, test standard. Um, it was actually a feature that was introduced in the building regulations that said if a product satisfied class one for both BS 476 part six and BS 476 part seven, then it could be called part, uh, class naught and used in essence where non-combustible materials were called for. The problem with this is that neither of those tests um, measure combustibility of material or core or the core of composite materials. Here are the tests. Uh, this is BS 476 part one. It's a very small scale. Basically you put it in front of a little furnace and see what happens. And it classifies spread of flame through that sample. Problem with things like this is uh, a simple foil coating can exert a, a very large influence on the result of a test like this, as can it in BS 476 part seven. This is probably a test that you've all seen, um, a simple I think, meter by a meter furnace um, with an arm out where you put the material on and look at the rate of spread along it um, and attempted ignitions along it occur over time. Now, it describes some things and it's not a bad test, but it really doesn't compete with a Euroclass test for what they're actually looking at. That's measuring a fire propagation uh, index. So these are now by and large discredited as a means um, for, um, for, for assessing uh, product suitability in certain locations. Um, but it was around for a long time and many people very, feel very strongly that actually it is this issue that is, is at the heart of the Grenfell uh, Tower issue. Um, it was introduced um, into the building regulations and um, it was considered um, wrongly to ascertain a level of uh, or products of limited combustibility and has been blamed for allowing combustible materials onto the market and be used in places it should not. Um, and these two systems co-resided for a long time. But really, uh, I think you can appreciate now, it's like comparing apples and pears. So it might be okay to assume that a Euro class B material will be class zero, um, but a class zero material may not achieve class B and might actually be much lower. 
a class D, E, or even lower than that. I think someone put it very nicely that a dog has four legs, but everything with four legs isn't necessarily a dog. Um, but you can, you only have to go online to see the, um, the conversations going on about how much the class zero specification and its introduction uh, was responsible for what is what we are seeing uh, in recent times. So let's get on to the uh, insurer questionnaire IQ7. These are quite powerful. We produce these for a number of instances where we feel the acquisition of information is problematic, either through a lack of pedigree of the system which it describes, or it deals with. And so I think IQs one, two, and three are actually dealing with different, different types of water mist system. And they are very good. There's a slight, uh, we have slightly underdeveloped standards uh, for water mist systems. And in there, there is a lack of appreciation um, of some of the risk control challenges, um, which are dealt with in more mature suppression standards, such as uh, the, our own sprinkler rules. And these questionnaires, in that case, seek to elicit that um, information that all the things that should be um, considered have been considered in some way, shape, or form. And obviously, where there are gaps, it gives an opportunity for the insurer to take discussions further uh, and improve the overall design. Uh, in the case, we've produced IQ6 recently uh, for massive timber structures, and that is a case where I think it's probably pretty clear that um, the <coughs> application of high-rise massive timber is probably uh, proceeding ahead of the research to really support its safe use. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the IQ7 has been produced because I hopefully I and I hope I haven't uh, uh, made things too difficult. But you can see that this is a complex area and it helps you elicit the information that you need to make some sorts of decisions on it. We have produced uh, we are producing a little tool which hopefully the output from this can be inserted into to help you advise further on whether things are compliant or not. That's in its slightly early days, but I will demonstrate it to you shortly. So it's a one-stop shop for you to get the information you need, rather than you asking repeatedly for lots of different things and being delivered data in different forms. Now, many of the questions might not be answerable. Specifically to do with planning systems, uh, if you think about it, um, you can have all the Euro class ratings you like. You can have maybe a certification route uh, that happens through the BS 8414 and 914 and 9414 systems. But at the end of the day, that test methodology doesn't have windows, doesn't have ducts and vents. And so if a duct or a vent is put through it, that must have meant that someone had made an engineering judgment that that is an okay thing to do. And this questionnaire looks for that. I don't think you'll find it. I think people just do it. But in that, there is there is a problem. And where you identify problems, it should serve as a red flag. And so it's very much uh, insurer focused, providing you with the information that you need. And now really is the time uh, to do the detail. Now, just a little bit on the 84, uh, a look back at the 8414 test and the criticisms that we leveled at it, um, having uh, conducted quite a lot of large scale uh, testing in our laboratory looking at it. Um, we had concerns about the realism of the fire challenge, uh, uh, of the installation itself, that it ignores ducts and vents, um, sealing of the voids, um, so maybe they are under oxygenated, which would help limit fire spread. Um, we had concerns about the performance of cavity barriers with some of the materials which are used inside the void itself, um, and uh, we saw an amount of over-engineering. So, you need to think about the one of the problems we've had is that the BS8414 test was used by the manufacturer as a product as a test of materials. You know, this test had Kingspan K15 in it, so therefore Kingspan K15 is okay to use. Clearly it's not, because actually it's a it should be a test of materials and the design detailing, because often these materials depend on being protected behind higher performing materials to create an overall pass. But actually what we end up with, it was a test of some materials because often they would leave out the membranes uh, and some design detailings because obviously it doesn't have windows or ducts and vents in it. So it's a little bit of a halfway house. 
Uh, a quick summary, and this is taken from previous webinars which we've given on the work of this. Um, just on the left-hand side, we looked at uh, a more modern fire load. The fire load for the BS8414 test is a simple wood crib. We know that 20% 20, 20 of a room's contents now may well be plastic-based. And we so we ran this test. We stopped it a little bit early because the roof of our building got a little bit hot. But I think you can see that on the same time scale there, the um, rate of fire heat increase uh, was a lot quicker. The maximum temperatures achieved uh, were, were quicker. Um, <clears throat> and also flame lengths were quicker also, which can be, if you're talking about multi-story fire spread, can be a key factor also. Um, as we move along to the side, you'll see uh, there's a building being stripped and you can see the vents coming out of uh, beside every window there. Probably these are kitchens stacked one on top of another. And uh, we looked into the implications of uh, fire escape from the fire compartment and even toxic smoke and fire ingress uh, from a fire in the void uh, into the room that it connects with and found there to be some quite uh, severe implications for design detailing there. It's important to note that the external envelope of the building isn't actually considered part of the um, uh, fire boundary or compartment boundary uh, of a fire compartment and so therefore these devices do not have to be fire stopped. They can be simple plastic sleeves uh, through. And then we also looked at the impact of vertical fire spread on the provision of oxygen. And um, we noted uh, very big differences there um, if you sealed up the edges of these rigs to if you left them open, which might actually better replicate um, a larger piece of cladding uh, over a greater area. Um, and we also replicated um, here, sorry for these rather crude diagrams, but I'll try and explain them as best I can. Um, the, you'll be aware that the government post Grenfell conducted a lot of tests, but actually we saw that they were over reinforced quite significantly. And so we conducted tests under the, under the advice of Arabs, um, where the fitment of the cladding system was more as it would actually be on a building. So top left there um, shows uh, on the left hand side, uh, the amount of railing applied to supporting the panels, the ACM panels uh, of a, a, a cladding system used for the DCLG test. And they have basically three rails per panel, whereas it's much more normal just to have two, as we have on the right-hand side of that left-hand picture. Um, below that, you'll also see that how the panels are attached <coughs> can have a bearing on system performance also. And on the DCLG test, every panel was attached to those multiple rails um, every 10 centimeters with, with rivets. That's not a normal way of applying ACM. Actually, they're hung on quite flimsy hooks onto the rails themselves, as we did on the right-hand side. And as you move to the pop, top right, we also found an over-provisioning of cavity barriers um, to break up the ability of the fire to spread behind the, 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 the system itself. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, all of their tests, as was common practice at the time, were did not include uh, the membranes, probably the one material in there that can spread fire the fastest and most universally quickest. And that was actually omitted from the tests. The upshot of this is when we ran the, we ran the DCLG tests, uh, which were used to show uh, the level of safety of buildings post Grenfell. Um, you can see very little destruction on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side of the, exactly the same system and the materials, a much greater level of descript, uh, destruction uh, and large chunks of material falling off because basically it had been over reinforced. Now that may sound like a bit of a moan, but I think it's an important uh, point to make. So the routes uh, to, uh, uh, to certification, um, we basically have a reaction to fire route using the Euro class and it's a relatively simple route to take. We have a non-combustible route but even the job doesn't need to stop there. We need to provide evidence that all the materials, uh, how they are tested and that they achieve the requirement uh, against the certification. There's also a further job to do that we need evidence uh, that it, it will be installed as it's been designed. And of course, the final thing is to quality of workmanship, uh, evidence that it's been installed as it's been intended. So a nice simple route and certainly the, the IQ7 can take you on that journey and allow you to put ticks in each of those boxes. 
going down the 8414 route um, of a system, a built up system test, it's slightly more complicated. Um, we'll call this com the combustible product route because you don't need to conduct these tests, obviously, if it's uh, all non combustible materials. Um, it's still important to provide reaction to fire test evidence. Um, that should not be omitted uh, from this route. So each component does still need to be specified properly. But then we need to look at the BS8414 and the BR135 test evidence. Now the critical things there, um, the mistakes which have been made is people just took these reports and saw that had the materials um, they, uh, they were using and thought, well, that's all right then. But actually, no, you've got to ensure that that report is absolutely relevant to the fixing methods used, the products used, the scale used, the panel size, the gap size, the void size, everything. And the IQ7 questionnaire gives you a tick box to check all those were correct. Now, some elements uh, may not be covered, and this may come down to the BS, be left to the BS9414 route. Now, the BS9414 route, uh, I will explain in more detail in the next slide, but that is basically uh, allows you to interpolate between two tests where one key factor has changed. So a product manufacturer um, may conduct a test where they've used insulation thickness of 80 mil and then conducted another test uh, with 150 mil. And as long as no other factors were changed and uh, the tests were both passes, then through the 9414 route, for certain elements, it will be okay to assume uh, that the test would still be valid for insulation thicknesses in between those two. So that's what that essentially takes care of. Now, the other bit that needs taken care of here is the engineering de design evidence of features not addressed uh, in, in, in any route. And here I'm specifically refer referring to the ducts and vents. You need evidence that um, uh, from someone uh, that the inclusion of a non-fire stop duct or vent would not change the outcome of the fire, expected fire performance of that cladding system. It's not addressed anywhere else. It seems to have gone under the radar. No one seems to mention it except us, but it is a key factor and it's included in the questionnaire. Um, and then the final two are common with the previous one. We need evidence of the design versus what actually gets installed and evidence of quality and workmanship. So this is what IQ7 attempts to take you through. Just on that point of BS9414, as I mentioned there, what it's changed, um, it's actually uh, quite good what it seeks to achieve. It seeks to ensure that any desktop study done to justify any component of the system is actually done between, uh, relies on, on experimental data between two pass points. And uh, so it can be interpolated between, but never extrapolates further out. One of you'll have heard the word desktop study used an awful lot. And what is clear is that people, even from a single point graph, were then extrapolating out in many directions with very little knowledge of how things would actually perform. Now, in the IQ7 uh, questionnaire, <clears throat> we actually give a scoring mechanism. And this is very deliberately put at the start of the document. This is for you to score the quality of the results the quality complete and completeness uh, of the uh, uh, answers that you get back from submission of this questionnaire. And really it looks for responsibility for whoever's completing the form, show a good understanding, have they shown a good understanding of the materials and declared very clearly what the certification route is. Um, and covered off these other elements, which are really not listed anywhere else um, to make sure that a full and proper process has gone through. Uh, these are now on the Risk Authority website. They are interactive PDFs, so we've made it as easy as we can for people to complete them. Um, but um, hopefully they're there to do their job. So um, it's a one-stop shop for you to elicit the information that you need. Just want to touch on finally the <clears throat> how can we deal with corruption? Uh, probably slightly harsh term, but um, if we don't know what the materials are, we do need to start identifying them chemically rather than trusting what's written on the box. Even within the constraints of the IQ7 questionnaire, if you're issued, now given uh, uh, the, the 
uh, the, the user might quite correctly issue the um, uh, 8414 report that shows everything's fine. Um, but uh, if that report doesn't actually hold fingerprinting information so that we really know what that product is, given that what Grenfell is now uh, exposing to us, um, it may be of limited value or there is all that there will always be um, a, a problem with not being able to trust anything fully. And one of the things that we're looking at hand in hand with uh, University of Central Lancashire is whether we can start to introduce into testing some form of fingerprinting. Now the devices we have here are three uh, quite commonplace pieces of analytical equipment. On the left hand side uh, we have a thing called an elemental analyzer uh, which what that does will you can put in uh, any foam or insulating product or plastic, and it will tell you quite quickly how much carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur is in it. So there's a, a, a nice form of fingerprinting. The item in the middle is called an ATR, FTIR, and what that does is really shines a laser on products and will give you its wavelength response. And it, from that, uh, that can be quite a discerning fingerprint of products. Used very, uh, used very extensively in, in drug testing uh, and the like. And the item on the right-hand side is the Federal Aviation Authority microcalorimeter, and that is uh, a, a method of determining the heat release rate uh, of materials. Now, between these three items of equipment, you can start to form a pretty good fingerprint. These I've taken from one of UCLAN's uh, reports on how to, uh, of, of possible methods of identifying unknown foam materials. And there you can see uh, in the table there, the output from the elemental analyzer. And you can see some pretty distinctive differences between a phenolic foam, uh, a, P a PIR, a stone wall, and a glass wall. So we can start to, so that starts the process. It's not infallible, but they believe with the other two fingerprints from the FTIR, I don't know how to read those graphs myself, but I'm sure they do. Um, and the heat release signatures, which are pretty good at demonstrating uh, differences between the uh, the PIRs and the phenolic foams, um, uh, the stone wall, glass wall. Um, I think between those evidence, you can come up with something quite compelling that can assist a report uh, so that you get greater levels of confidence um, in everything, uh, in, in what you're delivered and what the report is about. So I think we're coming up close to the end of the hour. We seem to have managed to time and I hope it's made sense to everyone. I just wanted to pull onto the screen here um, a tool which um, has been put together by Stuart Campbell following our deliberations of trying to understand the different building regulations from the uh, different countries within the UK um, because it has been complicated. And uh, Stuart has managed to really split down the question set to just eight questions. They're not necessarily in logical order. Um, but they do work. And I just wanted to show you, this is a kernel of an idea that we have, and I value your feedback on whether you think this is a good idea, uh, to produce a website uh, which takes the same inputs but will give you clear guidance on uh, the regulatory requirements for the different countries of the UK. So in this case, will the building be more than 11 metres tall? Um, it relates to a question of Scottish regulations, which we know are 11 metres. So if I say yes, it will be greater than 11 metres. Will it be more than 18 metres? We know that this relates to uh, English regulations. So I'll say yes, we'll take our um, classic um, tall building, um, try and find something, first of all, that would classify in England as relevant, and then we'll see how that changes to one when it's not relevant. Uh, will the size of the building be more than one metre, uh, not more than one metre from the boundary? I'll say no. Okay, question four. Will one of the stories have uh, uh, residential premises about 18 meters? So this is to see whether it's a relevant building. I'll say yes to that. Um, is it used for entertainment or recreational purposes? No. All these questions will become apparent when you go through the actual logic charts and the different building regulations. Is it a hospital greater than a certain size? No. And finally, is it a house? Um, and put in no. And what we can see here, it has populated very nicely the different building regulations that we have. Now, what we can see for England here is that because uh, it is a relevant building in that it has a, require, uh, a residential premises above 18 metres, you can see that um, 
compliance with BR 135 and 8414 testing is not sufficient, this does come under the combustibility ban. Um, it gives the alternative requirements for Scotland, which does still allow BS8414 testing. Uh, and it, it's not complete for Northern Ireland, but for Wales, um, you can see it, it, it can allow either. But they also still allow class zero uh, in there, as we saw before. Um, if I change this to being a non-relevant building, uh, I think by just simply saying it doesn't have any um, residential above 18 meters, so this might be classified as a, a hotel or uh, an office block, then you can see that the English regulations change to these two different routes. Now, the reason for putting this together is um, we had to go to these lengths to understand everything ourselves, and uh, I don't think it'll be uh, different for, for, for anyone else. Um, so I'd value your thoughts if you want to provide feedback as to whether if we put a simple web page on the Risk Authority uh, Internet uh, website, um, with a tool like that, um, which could take receipt of uh, some of the inputs from the IQ7 questionnaire, whether it would be valuable to you. Uh, I should add, actually, Stuart has made it, so it does also print out a very nice report at the end of the day uh, for you to consider and enclose with anything that you do. So I think it has legs, might be useful, but I certainly value your feedback. So I think as we come to three minutes to 12, I think just in closing, um, I have to review the learning outcomes. Uh, and uh, so we've been through the challenge of standards, which I hope I've made clear. Um, the new additional consideration, I think more and more is going to come out of Grenfell. It's quite compulsive watching. It's, uh, uh, it, it's rather, uh, dre well, it, it, it's dreadful by every account. And it makes you question an awful lot more, certainly from an insurer perspective. You know, um, what does it mean for LPS 1181 testing? sandwich panel testing approval, you know, for warehousing and the like. <clears throat> what are the ramifications for that? I think it opens up uh, certainly a, a hornet's nest of all other sorts of potential problems. Hopefully I've taken you through without uh, confusing too much uh, the methods for cladding system approval and the applicable standards. Uh, the class O problem, I think we now know that they are of very limited value to you in assessing um, uh, anything to do with materials that go into um, <clears throat> life safety uh, applications. Um, the shortcomings of BS 8414, I think we're aware of, but hopefully in all of that, uh, you can have confidence the IQ7 questionnaire really asks the right questions to get to where you need to be at the end of the day. And so with that, I will just wanted to show you a final little video. Some of you may have seen this. I mentioned earlier about how things like the cone calorimeter test and the class naught classification led to some very, very poor decisions. Um, people often get confused that they think of building products as not spreading fire too quickly. Um, but this test is this particular piece of video, it's only one minute long. And by the end, for the first 15 seconds, not a great deal happens. By the time it gets to its end, everything in front of you is on fire. This was from a CCTV camera. <coughs> This event happened in South Africa, and sadly, some people did die in this uh, fire, hopefully not the people we're looking at at the moment. Um, but this is a classic case where an insulator, a sandwich panel construction building, which could have been made of anything, they chose a polystyrene cord sandwich panel, and this was the result. The fire happened to the far left of this building in a kitchen where a duct went through the paneling system fire got into the panels, and this is the result, a fire faster than people can uh, run at. So all these standards that we've applied to, they are very serious in what they seek to achieve, um, but people shouldn't be misled that what we're talking about is slow stuff and that evacuation is obvious. There are certainly circumstances uh, where it's not. So. Just to finish off on that rather morbid endpoint, I do apologize for that, uh, but it is important to show uh, the, uh, the issues that we are actually dealing with at the end of the day. Uh, the IQ7 questionnaire is downloadable with all the others uh, from the Risk Authority website. If you haven't got access to that website, then please do contact Courtney. Uh, all Risk Authority member, members of all Risk Authority companies are allowed to uh, have, have full access. Please fill in the feedback form afterwards. 
Um, if you've seen anything which we got wrong, uh, which is quite possible, uh, please tell us about corrections, objections, questions, uh, and um, we'll provide answers to questions in a follow-up email. And uh, the other information we will use to try and improve future risk authority webinars. So with that, bang on 12 o'clock, um, uh, all I can say is thank you very much for listening. And um, please look out for further webinars. Thank you very much. Goodbye.